so the battle lines have been drawn. On one side are those who cannot imagine feeding the planet without putting biotech discoveries to good use. On the other side are staunch defenders of tradition, those who demand agricultural products free of chemical contamination. Genetically modified or biologically pure? That is the question. And as this expert is pointing out, these grains have different properties and characteristics. The problem I have is not whether something is genetically modified or not. It's not whether it's genetically engineered or not. That's not the question. My concern is, under what conditions can we safely apply these techniques in a responsible way, a way that will guarantee the absence of undesirable side effects? Right now, that's not the case, not in my opinion. Milk with extra calcium, decaffeinated coffee from actual coffee beans, eggs with less cholesterol, different colored rice, seedless watermelons. These are all examples of genetically modified products purposely developed from natural varieties that did not possess these characteristics. The procedure is simple enough. First, scientists select an organism with a desired characteristic, say, resistance to a specific disease, the ability to survive in one environment or another, or an especially rapid growth rate. It could be a plant, an animal, or a fungus. Then they search for the gene that provides the desired characteristic, extract it, and by one method or another, place it into the receptor species. The last stage of this process is simply encouraging the reproduction of the new variety under rigorous time control parameters. By the mid-20th century, there were some two million hectares of genetically modified crops in the world. Now, there are about 45 million. Actually, the most cultivated genetically modified crop is rapeseed, a plant used to feed cows, which are invariably made into hamburgers. But we should remember that many of these genetically modified species were originally developed in order to make better use of certain herbicides, or the truth be known, to force buyers of the seeds into using herbicides made by the same company that developed the seeds. But all this notwithstanding, there is every indication that the future of world food production will rely to a great extent on genetic engineering. During my lifetime, the world population has grown from 1.6 billion to about 6.1 billion, close to 6.2 billion now, and it will probably be about 8.3 billion by the year 2025. Can we produce the food that will be needed for that number of people? And can we produce that food without destroying our forest and our grazing land? for livestock and our habitat for wild species. I say, yes, we can produce that uh, food that will be needed if we do a proper job of uh, continuing through research to develop better varieties, better cultural practice to fertilize more efficiently. It's obvious that we cannot produce food for 6.3 billion human beings by using traditional agricultural procedures. According to Norman Borlaug's calculations, on the current amount of cultivated land in the world, we could only feed 4 billion using traditional farming methods.
We would also need between five and six billion more cows to produce enough manure to fertilize the soil. In other words, there would have to be two billion less people and over five billion more cows. Not exactly a viable plan for the future of humanity. The lives of the animals we eat might seem peaceful enough, but they're also very boring lives. These animals don't have to look for food or protection from the wind and rain. When they fall sick, they receive treatment, and they don't even have to worry about being eaten by predators, except for human beings, of course. But then again, they spend their days cooped up eating tired, dried feed full of chemicals and they tend to die at a rather young age. Their sex lives are practically nil. And as if that weren't bad enough, they live in pens so cramped that they don't even have space to play or stretch out. The fact is, the animals we eat are not happy. And while this may seem strange, it actually has a major influence on the quality of food these animals provide us with. Productive animal husbandry requires a habitat with the appropriate sanitary conditions and proper immunological controls. It is also fundamental to provide sufficient biological security so that infectious agents can't get in. The lack of balance in this area is what causes enormous problems when an infectious disease appears. It might be because the biological protection was inadequate, that is, the farm was unable to keep infectious agents out. But not only hasn't it kept infections out, these infections sometimes spread to other farms. And it isn't just because an infectious agent got in, but because it was allowed to coexist with the livestock under inadequate environmental controls. I believe the balance between these two factors, biological security and proper animal welfare, is what produces better livestock, higher quality products, and greater environmental security. At this stage, we are more than conscious of the fact that we need animal proteins in our diet. However, we are still not able to assert that we won't be victims of future catastrophes, such as the unfortunate outbreak of mad cow disease. And yet, at the same time, we can't afford not to analyze the advantages and disadvantages of the meat we consume, even though we have learned that certain alternatives are, without a shadow of a doubt, much more healthy. Ostrich meat, for example, looks very much like beef. Its taste and texture are similar. It has less cholesterol, less fat, fewer calories, and practically the same protein content. Initiatives such as these may constitute an authentic revolution in the 21st century with respect to our thinking about the raising of livestock and of culinary art and taste in general. Imagine a typical cooking program on TV. The cook presents his ingredients. Oil, parsley finely chopped, salt, pepper, and of course, the crickets. Crickets are insects of the Orthopteron family. They're easy enough to find and not very expensive at all. So what keeps us from tossing them into the frying pan and giving them that magic touch of parsley, salt, and a dash of pepper? Of course, you have to wait until they're nicely browned, but that doesn't take very long. And then it's dinner time, everyone. 
fried crickets, a dish that's probably somewhat repugnant to most of us, but it's actually not that much different, either aesthetically or nutritionally, from an exquisite order of calamari.